If you're after a family-friendly SUV that's reliable and economical, you should check out the Hyundai Tucson. But don't forget about the Honda HRV. And there's also the Nissan Qashqai to consider. And let's not forget the Kia Sportage. Well, in this video, we're going to find out which of these four is best. Buy, sell, car, wow. Let's start this video by comparing the prices of these cars. So this is their starting price. This is the price of the cars I've actually got on test today. And this is the average saving across the range for these cars through CarWow. Now, if you're thinking about buying a car and you want to see the latest offers and deals, click on the pop-out banner up there for the link in the description below to go to CarWow. You can also do that at a later date by simply Googling help me CarWow and we will help you change your car in fact, you can sell your current car through CarWow now as well. All you have to do is upload some photos, give a brief description, then dealers across the country will bid on your car. All you have to do is choose the highest offer and they'll come to your house, take the car away, and they'll put the money straight into your account. It is so easy. Surprisingly, while the Honda is the cheapest car here, it actually looks like the most expensive. Well, if you don't really take into account the size because it is physically smaller slightly than the other cars. But from every angle that you look at it, front, the side, the back, just looks good. You know, this is a family-friendly SUV that I actually want just because of how it looks. And that's why, out of the four cars, it wins the Matt Watson Design Award. Second place in the Matt Watson Car Design Awards goes to the Nissan Qashqai. It's got a really distinctive front end, stylish as well. Looks good from the side too and from the back. It's a great all-rounder in terms of looks. You'd be happy to have this on your drive. In third place in the Matt Watson Midsize SUV Design Awards is the Kia Sportage. Must say, really like the back, the way it's sort of got this ducktail spoiler. The side's inoffensive and the front's okay, apart from the headlights. A bit too much headlight going on, really. Speaking of which, that brings me on to what I think is the least attractive car of the four. I'm not the biggest fan of the look of the Hyundai Tucson. <laughs> That grill with the light design, a bit ugly, though to be fair, the light signature at night, you recognise exactly what car it is, even when you can't see it. But the rest of it is a bit of a mishmash of angles and design elements and bits seem to be poached from other cars. For instance, I think the wheel arches are a little bit like those on the Toyota RAV4, and the rear light bar is a bit like on a Ford Mustang Mach-E. The interior design of the Hyundai Tucson is all right. I quite like the step dash, though, this area here just seems a bit too black plasticky. At least the climate control buttons are separate to the infotainment screen. The infotainment system itself is fairly easy to use. I don't like this big pod so much though, where the drive select buttons are. It's not the best in the world, but it's acceptable. What's less acceptable is the quality of the material on the seats for something that costs this much. Jumping into this Kia after that Hyundai really puts the Hyundai into context because this interior is just so much nicer way more interesting loving the curved screen also i like the fact that you have a rotary gear selector rather than the fiddly thing that they have in the hyundai i thought hyundai was supposed to be the boss it's you know it's a hyundai motor company they own kia yet yeah, they're letting kia get away with building more appealing cars just like the kia the honda has quite a cool interior design but it's a little bit more lively thanks to this light colored bits of trim really do like that and oh, look down there we even have some bronze however it doesn't feel quite so high tech it doesn't have that big screen instead you've got this smaller screen that's plonked on top of the dash however the infotainment system is nice and easy to use unlike hondas of the past not so sure about this digital well it's not fully digital driver's display the one side is digital the other side has an analog dial it's a bit confusing and some of the materials are a little bit scratch in here I suppose this car is less expensive than the other three and that's probably where Honda have saved a bit of money. The Nissan feels a little bit darker than the more colourful Honda, but quality is better. Yeah, everything feels a bit more expensive. You can interrupt the voice prompt and give a command immediately by pressing the push to talk button, say phone, navigation, audio or information to see more commands for each category. Go away. What on earth did I press? I don't think I pressed anything. Anyway, not so keen on that. The rest of the infotainment system is pretty good and the digital driver's display is easy to see. And you have some separate controls for the climate, easy to operate while you're driving. Though this whole section does remind me of an old 1990s stereo. Also not convinced by the shape of the dash, though I do like the stitching. It makes it feel expensive. 
It feels quite premium in the back of the Nissan as well. I like the seat fabric. Really puts the Hyundai's to shame. Though the seat itself is quite firm. Hmm. Knee room's good though. Headroom, that's fine. This has got the panoramic roof, which does ease into headspace, but it's still okay. One issue I have is that with the driver's seat in the low position, you can't really fit your feet underneath the seat in front, and that's annoying because you do want to be able to stretch out. Because if you don't, there's not much under thigh support, which gets a bit annoying on longer journeys. If you have to carry three people in the back at once, it's very similar in terms of space to the Hyundai and the Kia. So doable, but you won't want to do it that often. Here in the back of the Hyundai Tucson, there's lots of knee room. Headroom's good as well. It's generally very comfortable. You can stretch your feet out a little bit under the seats in front. And look, you can recline the seat backs as well. Though you are going to always travel with them at the most reclined position because that is more comfortable. If you need to carry three in the back at once, you can just about. Although if it's adults that you're carrying, you're going to be struggling for shoulder room. It's a bit of a tight fit. Space in the back of the Kia is very similar to the Hyundai, no surprise there. Though headroom is slightly less, but that's because this car has a panoramic glass roof, which does eat into space a little bit. One thing I can tell though, is that these seat bases in the Kia seem a little bit deeper, so you get a bit more under thigh support, which make them a touch more comfortable. And the front seats seem a little bit more raised up, so it's easier to put your feet underneath the seat in front, though the floor's not quite so flat, though this middle seat is wider. So when you've got three in the back, it's just the same in terms of shoulder space, but the middle seat passenger has a more comfortable bottom. Then some other features I like, such as these grab handles, which you could also hang your coat off if you want to, here in the back of the key. You don't have those in the Hyundai, and the USB ports there, very, very clever. Oh, you can still recline your seats like in the Hyundai. I think this is a bit more comfortable in the back. Here in the back, the Honda does feel smaller than the other three cars, though it still feels quite airy because you've got this light interior trim on this particular car and funky seats that match those in the front, like those a lot. And to tell you the truth, knee room doesn't feel any worse than the other three. Their headroom is a bit tighter, but still, look, that's going to be fine for people over six foot. And I like the fact that these front seats are actually raised up quite a bit, so it's easy to just push your feet out underneath them like that. So it is generally quite comfortable. There is one slight problem with it though, and that's partly down to the fact that it has these clever seats that you can, look, look at this, you can lift these up, which is great if you want to carry things inside the cabin, all right? Something that you could fit there. However, in order to do that, Honda has had to give this car very separate seats between this one and this one. As a result, you get this slight mismatch in seat height there, and if you need to carry three people in the back at once, this central seat is truly awful. You feel like you're sat on half a bar stool. It doesn't help that this car's body is slightly narrower than the other three as well, so it's not great for three in the back at once. The Honda also isn't great when it comes to carrying stuff because the boot capacity is just 319 litres, and that's actually less than a Skoda Fabia. Still, unlike the Fabia, there isn't much of a boot lift, and there is a lot more space than in the Fabia when you fold all the seats down like that. Hmm, good. And let me just remove this boot liner here, which does say HRV on it, actually. You'll see that once you fold all the seats down, you get a completely flat low bit. It's so flat that you could actually use it as a bed. The Hyundai Tucson's boot capacity is 620 litres. Now, that's just for the normal petrol. If you have the self-charging hybrid, because you've got some batteries underneath the boot floor, that shrinks to 580 litres. And if you have this plug-in hybrid, because there's even more batteries than a motor under there, it shrinks to 560 litres of space. And with the plug-in hybrid, you're probably gonna to have to carry these charging cables around as well. Now, if you wanna carry lots of stuff, obviously you can fold down the rear seats. It's really handy. There's no load lip, so you can slide things in and out quite easily, but it's not easy to fold down the rear seats because you, I say not easy, it's not that hard, but you do have to go round to the side to do it. Look, there we go. I'm gonna really make a meal out of this now. I said it was hard. Oh, oh dear, look, I've got to go all the way around this side now. Oh, oh, what a painful process that was. The big capacity of the Kia Sportage is very similar to the Hyundai's, but not exactly the same. For instance, in the case of the normal petrol, it's slightly smaller, 591 litres. But in the case of this self-charging hybrid, it's slightly larger, at 587 litres. But with the plug-in hybrid version of this, 
it's smaller than the Hyundai, 540 litres. Confused? I am too. However, I'm not really going to dwell on that because that reduction in literage isn't going to have a vast impact on the ownership experience. What might do though is this. With the Kia, you can fold down the seats from the back because the releases are there. Bugger. You let me down, Kia. You let, you, why aren't you working? Look. The seat belt snagged, didn't it? Nah, that's better. Seamless this car wire thing, isn't it? Totally seamless. As you can see, there's a lot more room in the boot of this Nissan than there is in the Honda. 504 litres. Also, I like this feature. You have these boot dividers like that. Handy if you want to separate stuff out. Also, when you fold down the seats, oh, there we go, which you do using these handles on the seat back so you can reach through. You've got more space than the Honda. Look, it's just wider though. It doesn't go completely flat, so it'd be less comfortable to use as a bed. Though you're never going to need that really unless you've been kicked out of home and having to sleep in your car. You can get the Nissan Qashqai with a 1.3 litre turbocharged petrol engine with either 140 horsepower or 150 horsepower. Both of those, you can choose whether you want a CVC automatic gearbox or a six speed manual, and they're both front wheel drive. Then there's this version, which is the e-power. This has a 1.5 litre turbocharged petrol engine, though it never drives the front wheels at all. It just acts like a generator to charge a battery, which then provides electricity to an electric motor that does the driving of the front wheels. And that has 190 horsepower. There is only one power option available with a Honda HRV, so choosing which one to buy is simple. It's less simple for me to explain to you how the system actually works. So you've got a 1.5 litre petrol engine, which provides energy which can go into a battery which then sends it to two electric motors which drive the front wheels. So you think it works a little bit like that e-power Nissan. However, the petrol motor can also drive the front wheels as well. And the car just figures out what's the best thing to do for maximum economy. The power output is 131 horsepower. It's front wheel drive only and has a CVT automatic gearbox. There's three power options with the Hyundai Tucson. There's a 1.6 litre turbo petrol with 150 horsepower, and you can get that with a six speed manual gearbox or a seven speed dual clutch automatic gearbox. Then there's a self charging hybrid, which uses the same 1.6 litre turbocharged petrol engine, but it's boosted by an electric motor. As a result, you've got 230 horsepower. That car has a seven speed dual clutch automatic gearbox. Then there's this version, the plug in hybrid. Once again, 1.6 litre turbocharged petrol engine and an electric motor, but the electric motor is on the rear axle so it's got four wheel drive and 265 horsepower it's also automatic only though it has a six speed torque converter automatic seeing as the Kia shares its platform with the Hyundai it's no surprise it has the same power system so I'm not going to run through the stats again because they're the same apart from one thing with the Kia you can get the self-charging hybrid with four wheel drive not just front wheel drive Okay, let's see how these cars drive. And I'm gonna start off with the Sportage because it is the most conventional. This is the normal hybrid. So you have a petrol engine driving the front wheels and it's assisted by an electric motor. You can actually drive along at low speeds on electric power alone, but really that motor's there to help your efficiency and give you a bit of a boost when you pull away. You can see it says EV there, right? But if I floor it, the engine will cut in and it's reasonably smooth. So I'm gonna start off driving this car in town, see what it's like. First thing to note is the view forward is really quite good. The dash is reasonably low, gives you a great view forward. This pillar does create quite a blind spot, but the view at the back is fairly decent. Though there are some big rear pillars, which can be a bit of a pain when you're looking over your shoulder to pull out at junctions. Can't fault the suspension though. It deals with bumps really well, such as potholes and stuff like that. It's not jarring. Sometimes they can be on cars such as this, because when you have a tall vehicle, you have to stiffen the suspension up to stop it leaning so much when you're going around corners. The steering's nice and light for maneuvering in town. The only issue I have are the brakes. They can feel a touch grabby at times. Part of the reason for that is that the first part of your braking is actually using the motor in reverse to recharge the battery. And so as a result, it just doesn't feel as natural as if you've got a normal car that doesn't have that system. It's just using normal friction brakes. And obviously there's a crossover with this between that effect and the friction brakes actually being engaged. I'm probably getting too technical here. And I could have just summed it up by saying, the brakes are a little bit grabby. That's all you need to know. Gearbox though, nice and smooth around town. 
wouldn't even know it's got a gearbox. Can't feel it shifting gears at all. It's good, that. Let's see how well this Sportage responds when you're approaching a dual carriageway or a motorway and you want to overtake. So, I'm cruising at 40, I'm going to floor it. Now, yeah, slight hesitation, but it then gets up to speed pretty well and then shouts at me because I'm just drifting across the line without indicating. But the acceleration was strong enough to make my radio flop back in the cup holder. It's fairly decent. And cruising at speed, it's pretty blooming good this. There's not much wind noise, just a bit of a flutter from those big door mirrors, hardly any road noise. It's comfortable, deals with undulations well. Yeah, I like this. I like this a lot, but do I like the fuel economy? It's saying an average of 37.6 miles to the gallon, which is only okay. Now let's try this kit on a twisty country road. Question is, is it sportage by name and sportage by nature? I'm gonna put it into sport mode. That doesn't do much, adds a bit of weight to the steering and makes the throttle response a bit snappier. Let's chuck it at some bends. What's gonna happen? Well, it goes round them very well. A little bit of body lean, but not too much at all, actually. The steering is reasonably precise. This drives better on a country road than I imagined it would. I'm pleasantly surprised by it. So it's sort of sportage by nature. Well, for a high riding hatchback. <laughs> you know, you can only expect so much. But it's doing a decent job. And once again, the suspension out here, this is quite a bumpy road and it's dealing with the undulations and stuff. I think Kia have set this car up really well. Great balance of comfort and decent handling. Now, if you want to see my full in-depth video review of this car, we're going to get into detail about far more aspects about it. Click on the pop-out button up there for the link in the description below. This version of the Sportage is supposed to do 0-16, 7.7 seconds. But let's find out the reality with my specialist timing gear. Here we go. Launch time. How close can we get to that figure? Come on, Sportage. 7.19. That was a really good launch. Just grips and goes. Next up then, the Hyundai Tucson. Essentially, most of this car's mechanicals are shared with the Kia Sportage, so you can get a plug-in hybrid version of the Sportage like this particular car is. Now, one thing to note about the plug-in hybrid is that you can go up to 38 miles on electric power alone. So if you're just tootling around town, you can pretty much just drive this thing non-stop on electric power, which is what I'm doing now even gives you decent acceleration without the petrol motor kicking in. Now, if I had done that in the normal hybrid, you'd have heard the engine start up, but not with this. That makes it really relaxing, really smooth, really easy to drive. I mean, the car is pretty easy to drive anyway when the petrol motor kicks in. Look, I'm going to floor it. There you go. It came in there. Oh, gosh. I almost accelerated into our camera car, which is in front. <laughs> It started to do that auto warning, but for some reason, the brakes just didn't seem that great. <laughs> Speaking of the brakes, they are a little bit grabby. I think they're a bit more grabby than in the Sportage. I don't know whether it's because it's the plug-in hybrid version and it uses regen more. Can't possibly be that. They also make a bit of a noise sometimes when you're just creeping along. Hear that? And I've got a car behind me, so that's probably annoying them. Hear that? It's gonna really annoy them because they wanna turn down that road. Sorry. I can see them quite clearly because the view at the back's pretty good. And unlike the Sportage, you have some like little extra windows at the very back. So when you're looking over your shoulder like that to pull out of junctions, it's a little bit better in terms of visibility. This pillar's about the same and the dormer is about the same size. So yeah, very similar to drive and the driving position, very similar because like I say, they are pretty much the same car underneath the skin. Though they have been set up slightly differently. And I think that the Sportage deals with bumps a bit better than this. And across the same ranges, the plug-in hybrids always feel firmer because the cars are heavier, so they need slightly stiffer suspension. And so they're not so comfortable overall. So that benefit you have of it just like wafting along in electric power through town is offset by the clunky, clunky, clunky from the suspension. Okay, motorway time now with the Tucson. So 40 mile an hour, I'm gonna floor it. How will it compare to the Kia? straight away, a bit more pickup because it's a plug-in hybrid. You just accelerate the first part on electric power alone, although it's not that sudden, the acceleration, but it seems smoother, less hesitation because of the plug-in hybrid system. Now I'm cruising at 70. It seems to have a little bit more tire noise than the Kia, but a little less wind whistle, even though the door mirrors look about the same size. I don't get it. 
Still getting beeped up for the late departure warning of this, like in the Kia. It's a little bit sensitive. As for the economy, 45.6 miles to the gallon. Not sure it's worth it, you know, paying the extra for the plug-in hybrid just for that little bit better economy. Now, you could just like drive around at low speeds on electric in town and stuff like that, but electric isn't cheap anymore, not as cheap as it used to be. So I think you're better off just saving your money in the outset and getting the normal hybrid version if you buy one of these. Finally then, let's try out this Tucson on a twisty country road. So one thing to know about the plug-in hybrid is that it adds weight. So compared to the hybrid, it adds a further 200 kilos of weight because of the battery. And that affects the handling in more ways than one. Not only does it make the suspension firmer, but it does mean that it is not as accurate when you're throwing it through some corners. It's more like to push wide if you go a little bit too quickly. The car itself just feels a little less stable. It gets battered about a bit more because the suspension has to be stiffer to cope with that extra weight. I think in general, the Tucson doesn't have such a good balance between comfort and handling as a Sportage, regardless of which version you go for. So like for like, the Sportage is a slightly better car to drive. I mean, it's not terrible, it doesn't like topple over to the bends, it just doesn't feel as planted, it's not as confidence inspiring, it's just only ever okay. And the plug-in hybrid is the least okay of the lot. I mean, there, when we're around that corner, I just really wasn't sure what the front end was doing at all. Not ideal. Now, if you want to see my full in depth video review of the Hyundai Tucson for more information on it, click on the pop out banner up there for the link in the description below for that. The Tucson is supposed to do 0 to 60 in 8.6 seconds. It has 40 more horsepower, but it's heavier, so that's why the number's less. But what would the reality be? Let's do it. Launch. Feels fairly decent. I'm sure it's going to be quicker. Yeah, 7.48. That is pretty much a similar understatement as Kia made about the normal hybrid. But still, it's got more horsepower, but because it's heavier, the reality is it's slower. Why bother with the plug-in hybrid? Begs the question, doesn't it? I think the only reason you'd have the plug-in hybrid is if you're doing loads and loads of town work and you really like just driving around in that electric power. Otherwise, Pointless. I'm not a biggest fan of plug-in hybrids because ultimately it's the worst of all worlds. Oh, I know why you would have a plug-in hybrid. It's because their CO2 rating is so low because of how they work the system that they're really cheap on company car tax. It's any reason. All right, now let's try out the Qashqai. Starting off with it in town. It's very strange how this operates because you've got a petrol motor acting as a generator, but it never drives a wheel. So I'm going to put it into electric mode even though it's only ever driving on electric power that should keep the petrol motor out of things unless i floor it and then yeah it goes ev mode unavailable you want it to go too quickly i need to produce some power for the batteries and the motors that's what i imagine the voice of a cash car would be like anyway let's go back into ev mode and e-pedal as well which will give you maximum regen braking so it should really slow the car down a lot when i lift off the accelerator but the question is does it give me actual one pedal drive so I don't ever need to touch the brake. So I've lifted it off. No, it's still creeping, still creeping. But the regen effect is greater than in the other cars. Despite that though, I think the brakes are a little bit smoother than in the Kia and the Hyundai. In terms of visibility, view forward is pretty much the same as in the two cars. This pillar seems a bit more intrusive because I think it's a little bit more steeply raked towards your head. Yeah, the back window is really good though, can't fault that. And like with the Hyundai, you have an extra little light in the rear pillar to help get rid of that blind spot. I'm enjoying the fact that there is no gearbox at all. So you don't feel any gear changes. And when the petrol motor does like come into life, it's never driving the wheel. So everything just feels super, super smooth. That brings me onto the suspension, which deals with bumps really, really quite well. And the steering, it's nice and light without feeling totally like fake and disconnected. Time to try this car out on a quicker road. So once again, like the other two cars, I'm at 40, I'm gonna floor it, see what the pickup is like. It's interesting that, considering the petrol engine doesn't drive the wheels, there was a slight delay when I put my foot down. Well, the engine actually spun up to give maximum power for the electric motor. I thought it'd feel more like an electric car, the way it would just zip off straight away as soon as I floored the accelerator, but it doesn't. It feels conventional. And then when you're accelerating, you're getting like a loud from the petrol engine as it's working like a generator. Other than that though, 
It's reasonably quiet. It's a bit of road noise is what I'm noticing. All these cars are actually very similar so far, and they're very similar in the way that they beep at you when you're weaving across a line, although there wasn't a line there. It must have just spotted something weird in the road. Anyhow, let's check out the economy. 36.4 miles to the gallon. So even though it's a very clever hybrid, the economy is slightly less than the normal hybrid of the Sportage. Time for the cash car to be flung down a twisty road. So we're going to put it into sport. That does improve the throttle response a bit. It makes the petrol motor cut in a bit sooner. Give you that power that you need. Oh, actually, do you know what? I quite like the way this steers. It's sort of natural and responsive. I like it. Definitely better than that Hyundai Tucson. Also, in terms of weight, it's just over 1.6 tonnes. So 200 kilos lighter than that plug-in hybrid Tucson and about the same weight as the normal hybrid version of the Sportage. And like the Kia, it's doing a good job of blending comfort with road holding. Look, pretty fast corner. Does all right going around there. Yeah, 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 I know, I was near the white line. Ah, does in my head in that does. Yeah, it definitely feels more like a conventional car than an electric car, apart from when you're just cruising along in electric power alone. Anyway, quite a lot of the way this drives. Now, if you want more detail on the Qashqai, watch my full in-depth video review of this car. Just click on the pop-out banner up there for the link in the description below. Go check it out. The Qashqai is supposed to do 0 to 60 in 7.9 seconds. Let's see what it does, though, in reality. Here we go. That's so silly. I like, held it on the brake and thought that it would actually start that petrol motor running before I actually launched it to give maximum power immediately. It didn't, it waited for like the first few meters of me driving off. Still, did 0 to 60 in just under 7.5 seconds, so quicker than they said. Finally then, we're gonna drive the HRV, starting off yet again in town. So the way the system works is all a little bit confusing, but, the petrol motor can provide energy to the battery, which then drives the two electric motors on the front axle, but sometimes it can join in with them to provide power directly to the wheels as well when you need a burst of performance or if you're traveling quickly. So driving around town, it's not gonna do that. It's all gonna be the electric motors driving the wheels. Occasionally, the petrol engine might kick in just to provide some extra energy to the battery. You don't need to think about it, just let the car do its thing. It's designed to make it as economical as possible. And at the moment it's thinking, well, I can just run off the power in the battery. Look, we don't need the engine. And so it's quiet, relaxing, perfectly good for driving around town. Also the suspension, it's nicely judged. It's not too soft and squidgy and it's not too firm. So you don't feel bumped badly, though you do know they're there. The steering's nice and light and it's accurate. Plus, the brakes are fairly progressive, though once again they are doing that whole regen thing, but the transition is quite natural. And if I want stronger regenerative braking, I can just pull up on this, what would normally be the downshift paddle of a normal automatic car, to increase the amount of regen I get. Though it's not like the Nissan, where it really does slow quite severely when you have it in its maximum setting. I think it's probably best to just have it in just normal. So it just feels like a standard car rather than giving you strong regen because it doesn't do the whole one pedal thing anyway. Visibility is pretty good though. You notice that you don't sit up quite as high as in the other cars I've driven. Brilliant big door mirrors though, good for maneuvering. Great view at the back window, but there's not that extra window that you get in some of the other cars though. So you've got a big blind spot with that rear pillar. Okay, so we're heading to a faster road now. What happens when I accelerate the HRV from 40 up to 70? I think I know, I reckon it's gonna make a racket. Let's find out. Yes, it does. So it's got a CVT gearbox and you probably heard it. There's a bit of a delay and then the engine really picked up. It was like, ah, and then it did a noise like it was changing gears. So it's got like fake actual gears, even though it's a CVT, constantly variable transmission. Very strange but you do get quite a loud noise as that engine works hard to not only power the wheels, but also provide some power to the battery and stuff like that. All a bit confusing. Also, I think this is the noisiest car in general. There's just more road noise and a bit more wind noise from those massive, massive, massive door mirrors. I guess being the cheapest car here, it has a little less spent on sound insulation. Yeah, it may sit in that halfway point between different classes in terms of its size, but it does feel smaller than the other cars I've driven. 
bit more like a normal hatchback, really. But will it have smaller car economy? Well, kind of. 44 miles per gallon, which is pretty similar to the expensive plug-in hybrid version of the Tucson. Twisty country road time, let's go into sports mode. I feel the performance. Though note to yourself, Matt, do not pull on these paddles. They're not to shift gear, they're to alter your regen braking. Do you know what, straight away, driving down here, I can notice this car feels lighter than the others. It's just a little bit more nimble and agile. Oh. So nimble and agile, in fact, that I'm actually right at the arse of our camera car. Sorry, camera car. It's got various noises going on, the beeping of that warning system and the, ah, the moo of the engine. It's like some kind of depressed cow, like moo. But actually, the way this car goes down a country road isn't depressing at all. It does all right with the bumps, the steering's fairly accurate, it's got enough grip. Even though it's front wheel drive, the traction out of the bends is fine. It's just that mooing, that constant mooing. And that beeping warning, okay, I get the idea. This will go down a country road as quick as you ever need it to for this type of vehicle. No, it doesn't lean too much in the bends, it stays fairly flat. But then I guess it isn't quite as tall as the other cars. It was definitely the best down that country road section though, for sure. Once again, if you want to see my full in-depth video review of the Honda HRV, then click on the pop-out banner up there in the top right-hand corner of the screen or follow the link in the description below. Final launch then, this Honda. Especially the Nord 16, 10.6 seconds, so the slowest here. Let's find out what the reality is. Here we go. Oh, we yeah, can brake boost this. Here we go. Oh, wheel spin. Can you hear the fake gear changes? <laughs> Adds to the drama. But what's the real time? 9.08, not as quick as the others, but the difference between what Honda said it would do and what it actually did is greater than with the other cars. An improvement of 1.6 seconds. So then what's my final verdict? Well, the high-end i Tucson is a good car. It just doesn't do anything particularly special and I'm not convinced by the design. I do prefer the look of the Honda HRV. I like the car overall, it's just that it's not quite as practical as the others here in this test. Then we have the Nissan Qashqai. This is more practical, looks good, it's good to drive, very, very good car. However, it's beaten ever so slightly by the Kia Sportage. Yes, it may share many of its parts with the Hyundai Tucson, but there's just something about it which is better. It's better to drive and it's better to look at. Now, if I'm buying this car, I would definitely go for the hybrid and not the plug-in hybrid version. But overall, it gives you a lot of choice and it is a great all-round family-friendly SUV. And that's why it wins this test. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, give it a like. Let me know if you agree with my verdict in the comments below. Click on those windows there for some more videos. And on that box there to go to CarWow to change your car the easy way.